All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. And um, thank you also. Um, thank you, Christine, for making that acknowledgement. Um, I was going to do that as well, but I will still make the acknowledgement and say I'm very um, grateful to be here on the Ohlone's ancestral territory and back here at Berkeley. Why am I here, here, not here in this room today, but here back in Berkeley? So I live now in Italy with my wife, who is also an archaeologist. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, this is a little bit of a coming home, so I was really grateful that there a slot opened up that allowed me to be here. I'm not going to talk about Codify um, too much in terms of it from a perspective, as, except to say that after this entire life's time of trying to get this going, it's happening. So we have a company and we're launching a product this month. And it's going to begin right here. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. I think it's a big deal. It is the first platform. I think we can say that it's been designed expressly of for and by archaeologists to support our work. Um, I will be acknowledging all the failures uh, that we've gone through to get here. Um, so I'm going to be very clear about that too. But um, okay. So I just thought we're so next year, 2024. <coughs> Sorry, Christine, I'm going to do it again. It'll be the 25th anniversary of our cohort. I'd like to do a shout out to Dave Palmer, who's having a birthday today. I think he's 95, that's how it feels. Um, and so I got asked to be part of a symposium that's kind of looking forward to what, what professional archaeology might be doing into the near future. And I, I'm just using this as an opportunity to go around and talk with people. We may even do it as a podcast, we'll see, but just to collect stories about what has and has not worked. So I'm just gonna tell a couple of stories here and then hopefully have time for, we will be time, I'm sure we have time despite the technical challenges to just kind of openly talk about what is and isn't working. But I'm not gonna to cover today because this is interesting, the, the second stop on the tour, the last, thing with, last night with Ruth actually, Tringham, is AI and generative AI and machine learning and data sovereignty and all these things that I actually really want us to talk about. I want us to talk about that, but I'm just not, because the whole point is to hear from you all. So with that in mind, <clears throat> um, this is a slide I put together over a decade ago, but it still resonates. This is a concept of belong now, okay? So to keep us kind of, what's keep, kept me calm, although I still have plenty of gray hair about this digital preservation stuff, is the idea that this digital revolution has been just a blink of an eye, really, really short amount of time. The Long Now Foundation, which is in San Francisco, thinks about recalibrating time to a 10,000 year forward and back time frame, which again, kind of helps when so many things are happening in this world that are so tragic right now. Um, and they see the hits keep coming, keep coming, but, they call nowadays to be kind of the last decade to the next decade, the last the, this 30 years. So if you think about it, we're doing another reflection of that in my time frame of thinking about digital archaeology over the last 30 years and, and where we might go into the future. This is Abby Smith Rumsey, and she gave a talk just last night on how um, the rewriting of history can have very strong deleterious effects, especially for totalitarian and authoritarian kinds of uh, individuals and organizations. I think you, you should be able to guess she's actually a Russian scholar. Um, and she has a new book out, which I highly recommend. Um, she's been a hero of mine for a lot of reasons. Um, her advice yesterday in, in speaking was, um, the alternative facts are coming not just from the right, but they're also coming from the left. And if you don't agree to that concept, go find someone that's as, about as opposite as you are in terms of your political, spiritual beliefs and just have start having an open conversation about it. I thought that was kind of good. 2016, she wrote this book. And this book had a very strong impact on my thinking about how digital memory is shaping our future. She points out that, you know, the latest rave was, you know, the inter once back in the day, there was the internet, social media, and now AI. These things seem to keep coming, but we haven't even caught up in our thinking about the advent of the internet. 
So this quote, the fundamental purpose of recording our memories to ensure they live beyond us um, will be lost in the ephemeral digital landscape if we do not become our own data managers. And this is a person who was uh, a advisor to the Library of Congress on their blue ribbon panel specifically for digital preservation. And um, she was more optimistic <laughs> uh, when I spoke with her in 2017. Now she's become pretty, I say, uh, I say rightfully cynical about, about this. Um, the skills to control our personal information over the cost, course of our lives are essential. And this is kind of the fundamental right and belief that I believe that, that um, many of us would hold. So that in mind, um, that picture was taken right there in what used to be an office out here in the atrium before all of that. When um, when Christine says I spent, I used to live here, I'm, I literally lived here. There was a time as an undergraduate where I actually slept in that office. I don't think I should say that loud, but I did. Um, this was the Berkeley Inn. Um, I, I ironically state this is when I had less hair. Um, but you know, we were using WordPerfect and using CD-ROMs and physical film slides and also trying to render things using a supercomputer in Worcester Hall for one 640 by 480 image took three days. So you had to be, you had to choose wisely. And we call that project, Project Chimera because it was all the idea of this unattainable dream. And here's Ruth and I in 1995, my first ex excavation project, um, trying not to be eaten alive by mosquitoes while we are actually trying to figure out how to digitally reconstruct her former project, Opavo. I spent most of my time here. Christine and I spent some good quality time here. at Chateau Huyek, and as Christine mentioned, I, I focused mostly on uh, this idea of vision um, and how archaeologists see. I called it the duh hypothesis, which basically meant that if you can see more stuff, you'd find more stuff. And then I made a science scientific experiment to prove that that, yes, in fact, was true. Um, we did some digital in, digitally innovative things back in the day. Um, we used climbing gear to get up and do, you know, high, you know aerial imagery um, and, and daily plans, as you can see. We use Palm Pilots, which I dare say is still one of the best technologies ever. Um, everyone's all into this physical keyboard stuff, I'm saying, it was all the rage. And we made a physical book, The Last House on the Hill, uh, Bach Reports, but along with that, uh, the first tragedy I'll point out was we also committed to having all of the digital materials of this project available. The Living Archive at Tatsuhik, that site is for is no longer that site does no longer exists, and all of this material still does not have a home um, because things change, and that's the kind of the punchline I think of this whole talk. So um, I wanted a job. I couldn't find one. So we started the Center for Digital Archaeology in 2010. That's pretty much actually true. Um, and there were some grant funds that came in. And the main thing that we worked on at CODA was this, was Mukadu, which is the Washington State-driven, uh, now international open source platform for indigenous cultural heritage and knowledge. I'm very proud of the work that we did on that. And, it's, and that project is still thriving. And it's really exciting. But along the way, I kept getting challenged to build something specific for archaeology. And I didn't know a whole lot about professional archaeology as in CRM, as in California DPR 523 forms. Um, I certainly have learned a whole lot since then. We did a lot of really interesting projects. And here's where my sto stories are going to begin. So I'm probably going to maybe tell one and a half instead, which is fine. But um, Again, this is the part where I'm going to acknowledge that we, I'm going to call it failed forward. So if I talk about it in any other way, I'm probably going to start crying, which is not a good look. But you know, I acknowledge you know Tim Gill and Meg and others, um, Bonnie Clark, etc., for projects that we have tried this experiment of digital archaeology and actually failed. And the failure to me means that we've actually lost data, and that is an inexcusable thing. Now. Um, We've also done, we've had a lot of success in that, but this just emboldened me to making sure that that will always be true. But it is challenging. It's a very, very challenging thing. <clears throat> At the 82nd anniversary uh, annual meeting in Vancouver, I met this guy. I actually get to work with him now. He, uh, that's a whole another fun story. This is Jurgen Van Wessel, very interesting guy. And I kept hearing about this thing called the HS2. What's the HS2? The HS1 
was the channel between France and England, nations two, is now has is being built and large, large sections of it have been built, but will be the largest single civil engineering undertaking in the UK to build a high-speed rail to connect, as I would say, farm to table between London and Birmingham. It just so happens that between those two cities is a tremendous amount of archaeology, and some of that archaeology lives under St. James Gardens, which is a modern cemetery, and the same up at Park Street in Birmingham. So the Museum of London and Headland Archaeology, two of the larger CR cultural firms, archaeological firms in the UK, built a too big to fail consortium. And they asked to try an experiment, which was to try to see what would happen between paper recording, a combination of paper and um, digital recording and pure digital. And they asked us to build the application to do it. So it was a big risk, but we tried it. It had to be as good as the Museum of London's paper system, which is, by the way, the system that we use at Chatsal here, it's like the Red Book of Archaeology. Um, it had to work without any form of connectivity. It had to be able to record terabytes of data. This is 2017, just to be clear. It had to be trainable, but there were not enough people to do this work. They needed to train up 200 people to do the work. And they needed to produce archival quality products that would adhere to the archaeology data services standard. So. No big deal. <laughs> um, I wasn't able to even talk about the project until it made the front page of the Guardian. But this is what we built. We built an application working direct what calls user centered design, working specifically with the users daily, and it had a pretty significant outcome. This working audio or us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but it's okay. You can use it again. It's got subjects. There's that. <laughs> the punchline of this this was a, a modern a modern cemetery that had over eighty thousand people. Um, they had to build a, an 11 million pound, as in dollars money, <laughs> roof because um, in the UK has a, a, a policy for not seeing human remains um, unless you wish to. It actually became a very interesting public archaeology project because you know many of the folks, their, their ancestors were uh, actually buried at the cemetery. And so it, it actually became, it was a very good success from a, from a public archaeology perspective. If you look really closely, we'll see one tablet over there. Um, we built a, a sketching system into the platform. Um, these were early days. A QAQC system that made it easy to record the data across, across and check all that. And the outcome was something like this. This is the reality of doing digital archaeology in a flooded, this is in the 2018 when the flood you know, waters were, were high. Um, and this person who looks really happy had to take all of the data off of these iPads um, every single day and back them up. 180 iPads a day it was insane, <clears throat> but but it worked, um, and it was it was really exciting in comparison to the volume of, of fields, which are thousands of fields of data being collected. The paper and and hand types solution that they had before would have entered seven, so all of that data would, would would have been trapped on paper and would not be something that could have been used for analysis. So that's pretty cool. Two stories. Um, during COVID, we all here will remember that in 2020, um, 11,000 dry lightning strikes started hundreds of fires in Northern California. And <clears throat> These fires would become known as the CZU complex and would burn 86,000 acres, destroy 1,500 buildings, but also most of the structures and trees in Big Basin Redwood State, State Park. Um, this does have audio. If it doesn't, let me just try. I don't want to attempt the. 
I'll, 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 it's okay. I'll speak over it. So um, what happened basically is that, you know, you have a skate park, you have people in the park, park rangers, with several hundred people. And this happened so quickly um, that they had to, it, it just became a, a crisis and an emergency. But um, they successfully got every single person out. So no one died in the park. People did die in this fire, unfortunately. And all of the buildings, over 180 structures were com completely destroyed. And that included, I'll wait for the punchline here, um, everyone you know, getting out of Dodge, there included the residence houses that were actually destroyed by this fire. So a former client um, and friends of Santa Cruz State Parks reached out to us to see if we could help build some form of rapid re reporting system. The challenge is they gave us a week <laughs> um, and they needed to record <clears throat> new GIS locations, but they also wanted to be able to bring to that while working in the field, the historic photos, so they could do these quick assessments. The entire purpose of this was to do a FEMA assessment. So they didn't need what's known as, some of you probably have heard of the California DPR system forms. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if you hadn't, because again, I didn't learn about it a whole lot in this room because we do a different kind of archeology. span But if in effect, they wanted all of the previously recorded data to be put on tablets so they could take it out and we do this quick assessment. By virtue of doing that, then the state, then the state, the state and the federal uh, FEMA would declare it uh, an emergency and provide insurance relief. So we built a tool to be, bring all the data in effectively. Um, and we just went in and used humans, us, <laughs> to go in and look at the previous recorded UTM coordinates and convert that into actual digital data, stack that in field maps, which is an Esri product. Uh, you, you have to keep in mind at this point, there was no, there were no services in the park because they were all burned together. Okay. It was on, it was still on fire when we went there. It was pretty intense. So I'll skip all that. Um, this is us doing the actual training, similar to what, what I just mentioned in the project in, in uh, the UK. Uh, we had a team of about 10 people. We had four iPads and we, we trained for about 40 minutes and then we just set people loose. Um, this is Kathleen Kennedy. What's really neat about this is Kathleen works for the state and she actually did all of the original DPR Recording. So she she was there. She wrote the original narratives for this particular place, which was great. She was very uh, to say that she was um, pes not pessimistic, but like wasn't wasn't into this whole digital thing. By the end of about two hours in, after she realized that dictation worked and she could take all the pictures that she wanted, and we could meet her standards, she was all in on it. So that was really exciting. It's also very heartbreaking, as you can imagine. We all just kept our our, our stiff upper lip. Again, this says audio. This is Michael Jashinsky, who also works for the state. Uh, we taped the south southeast corner, um, did a new submeter datum. You can see the um, the outboard receiver. I'm not here to talk about things that are very fancy. I'm just trying to talk about things that are actually impactful on work. So the impact of this is we were able to record uh, all of this, all of the places of interest within Big Basin, as well as the historic. Cascade Ranch, which was also severely damaged, and Gaza's State Beach Park in four days, including finding and recording new archaeological sites, which is kind of cool. Basically, it allowed them just to record a, a description, add photos, um, write as, as robust a narrative as they would like to, and then generate something that looks like this, a basic, a basic report, in effect. So for me, as a Californian born and raised, um, this project had, a, as you can imagine, had a tremendous amount of, kind of emotional impact. Um, and it also was really exciting that it actually worked. I, I have the pleasure of meeting tomorrow with Michael Jasinski, who I haven't seen since this project, because he, you know, according to him, this, the, the impact of our work has made a significant difference. And there still doesn't seem to be something as kind of simple as this. There's kind of always been the goal. All right. Like I said, I mostly want to talk to you guys. So I'm going to skip to the end and just say two things. The first, as I mentioned, is Codify. So Codify, we started, I should move back to here. Like I said, we did a lot of projects around the world. Um, and 
we've had some great successes, but as I mentioned, we have had some failures. And I think that that's an incredibly important thing to acknowledge. Um, the greatest failure is I'm not a software engineer, <laughs> okay? I'm, I play an archaeologist on television a lot of ways how I feel, but um, but to, to Christine's point, I have a lot of passion around it. And we had we had a, a great amount of, of skills, but we were never big enough to really pull this off. And that is what led to the acquisition of Credify in 2019, is that we just, we raised money and we ran out, which is how these things work. Um, and and then in 2020, at the end of 21, Taylor West was got an acquisition offer effectively by a private equity firm. And that then in, in their discovery, they realized that there's a software company inside of it. And so that is what has ultimately led to us having a company that has, wait for it, over 50 employees now, uh, and who are professional software engineers who are helping make this all happen. Um, I'm very pleased to be participating with Sarah on the Fair Care project. We can talk a little bit about that too. And these, these initiatives that are going to, I think, help us finally get to what I'm considering to be the failed promise of digital archaeology, something that actually might actually work going forward. Because we don't have audio, this is a, just a quick screen of what the actual application looks like. And if anybody wants to talk about it afterwards, happy to do so. Last night, I thought it would only be right to start this whole tour with Ruth. So that's Ruth Trim. That's her drawing. And she wrote, she wrote to me a while back and said, she's going to give a talk about this on November 1st. So I'll try not to spoil it for her. But uh, this is what she told me I could say. So basically what happened is uh, she got contacted by some folks that are doing really advanced uh, remote sensing work in the former Yugoslavia, where Opovo, this project was. This was the very first thing I did as my honors thesis as an undergrad, I was working on this project back in the day. And uh, so she drew this thing and, and kind of sh frankly sheepishly asked me if I would help to send me the data. And Yesterday, last night, um, over tea, we just sat down and started looking at the data and we're able to put together um, effectively all of it really quickly in a couple of hours. It doesn't have a home. I'm thinking open context would probably be the right place for that. But what it means is, as she said, um, which is pretty, pretty amazing, is that that project, which is 40 years ago, <laughs> I was still in, in um, was, uh, is gonna be the ground truth for this new work going forward. And that to me is the punchline. It's like we, it, the digital work that we've been doing over the last decades and going forward, if we don't figure out how to make sure that it will be preserved, then that digital dark age concept for this kind of work is going to happen. That's kind of the, the sad the sad making I have for us. So because of the audio, I'm not gonna play this, but I will um, add it later and say, I'll call it there. And say thank you. So what I'd like, love to do is just hopefully um, open up. I'd love to hear from you guys about what is and isn't working in your worlds of digital archaeology, um, or where, wherever we want to take this conversation. Thank you. Tim. Yeah, Mike. Thanks for the talk, and uh, it's a super interesting topic as always. Um, I guess I have just a general background question, which is those of us who have a lot of data out there somewhere, there's always this perennial problem of technology changing, like you showed the CD-ROM and some of the stuff in the old days. What is this, where do you put stuff now? Is it good enough to put it on the cloud and assume that the cloud companies will update over time? Or what is a safe storage place for all this data? Because you must, all your projects generate, well, all projects generate a whole pile of data, so. Just curious about your thoughts on that. So, um, I, I, a lot of you haven't had the pleasure of meeting my wife, but uh, when we moved to Italy, and you you know you have to ship cargo, she was really excited that I decided to ship our Peloton and all my hard drives, which weighed about as much as the Peloton. So, I mean, I've been the the digital hoarder of drives for for all this time, and yes, they they take they just you have to keep moving them forward. The cloud has its own challenges. I mean, and 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 one of the things we're going to be doing with Codify is building a solid data sovereignty sovereignty barrier between our ability to see data and making sure that we're following all the different international standards, ISO standards, GDPR, et cetera. It's extremely complicated. 
So I sadly don't have an answer. I mean, the, the answer is, you know, it's just, you just got to keep moving the data forward. Um, I'm not opposed to the cloud. We use it all the time, but, but it is the notion of keeping data in more than one place and keeping it safe. I remember Chris Hoffman, we had a server in the data center um, that we had to, we had to murder it. <laughs> Ultimately we had to put it down. So it's, it is, it's just an incredible challenge, but I'm still alive. So I keep going, Sarah. Well, so that, um, I wanted to ask about that as well. Um, just the idea of having lots of copies of things that keep stuff safe, you know, that locks acronym. Um, but I think for individual researchers, uh, like you're saying, like, what do I do with my stuff, right? When you're working on it and, and keeping track of your own content, but then what do you do later? And as you were talking about failures and that kind of thing, I was thinking about how we still need so much to have better relationships with libraries and archives. And we're doing so much of our work independently and trying to figure this out, but if they have their training and they have degrees in this and they do this kind of thing. And so like e-scholarship has, you know, the that's the place where you can put your stuff and you can archive it and then they make sure that it gets carried forward. And so I think there's a lot of um, discussion that we still need to have around what do we as individuals and as projects do to save keep our stuff into the future without having to feel like we have to be responsible for it in our closets, you know, like on zip drives or whatever. Yeah, it's, it's totally true. There, there are a couple of challenges to that. One of them is it comes down to what I've made as a kind of personal distinction between personally identifiable data, things that are about, you know, if you think about food security and, and, and or personal knowledge and memories versus stuff that could be and should be in an archive. And so the stuff that matters the most, back to uh, Abby Smith Rumsey, is at the most greatest risk. Frankly, I'm much more concerned about our data. <laughs> you know, the picture, I, I was just trying to find the hard drive that has all the pictures of my kid when they were born 12 years ago. And I, the file that has all the photos is locked in a little Apple Photos thing. And I can't open it, so we'll see how that goes. Hopefully I won't get divorced over it. Um, the other challenge, uh, which is the other real purpose of this whole like uh, walkabout I'm doing between now and SAS next year is professional archaeology, where most of the archaeology is actually done, right? 80, 90 percent of us. And the standards for for archiving uh, that data are all over the map. And it's, it's in, in just an incredible challenge. So that frankly is a reason uh, I didn't start codified, but as a reason, well, I haven't given up on it because it is just, it's a hot mess, really, so. Well, kind of along those lines, Michael, this is something you and I have talked about any number of, number of times. One of the beauties and challenges of archaeology is that it's so rich and diverse and complex. So as you think about like this new platform you're developing, how do you handle kind of unique needs that come up for a project, like the, the big basin project, that's kind of archeology, span but kind of a, an extension of archeology. span how, how do you make something work for every different kind of project? That's a great setup. Um, there, first, not taking your eye off the first prize, which is that there have been, this is the part where Sarah's asking me if I'm okay with this being recorded, and I, I totally am. So the really honest answer is that staying focused on the one target of we're going to build something that will work 80 percent good but 20 percent not like you don't get to tell microsoft that you don't like the ribbon or clippy or whatever <laughs> something of that nature that's the first part of it but the other thing was to build a platform that makes it possible for you to be able to adapt it to your work and that's the really exciting thing that this new platform is, is going to make possible is what we're calling the configurator which makes it you know so you can effectively convert your workflow and your, in your practices so that the tool isn't driving you, you're driving the tool. That's always been the goal. It's an experiment, we'll see if it works, but that's just one thing. That's just codify, but. Um, so for example, we're not gonna start with excavation. We're gonna start with survey because survey is 80% of the work that is done in professional archeology span right now. We're starting in California because believe it or not, it is data standards that have not changed since 1995. So it's a, it's it's ripe for for uh, for change, um, and 
and then doing these, we call them data therapy sessions, going around talking to people about, you know, what their what their needs are in their projects so that we can have folks influence the roadmap going forward. So I'm not running the company. I have no one reporting to me anymore because we have a COO, she's absolutely amazing, who doesn't allow our ideas to get to the product team so that they'll just get the first thing done. Um, and that, dis that, that discipline is really import important. At Mont Collier, really quick, at Mont Collier, they, have, they do a 20 meters, a 10 foot survey, uh, metal detector surveys. And that 10 foot survey, somehow it just killed us. It was just really, really should it be any different? It's just smaller space, and, you know, but there were, the workflow that they do on paper works. But when you try to translate that to a digital tablet, it just didn't. It took, I mean, it, we did it, we basically volunteered our time, but it was like, that's the kind of thing that if you're building a software that has to work, I always think about like, I have a Tesla, which I don't, but if I did, and you want that, you want that, that software just has to work. You know what I'm saying? Like, you, you don't get to, yeah, but, but also played off the music, that'd be really great. I have a microphone. Yeah. <laughs> so you, this is great and something for everybody. So I want you to tell us, after you did the MOLA, or the railroad tracks, which are weird because they may never happen, uh, <laughs> what, you came, what you learned from that and how you adjusted. I mean, I'm assuming you didn't push the button once and go pathetic and off they went. There must have been some learning curve. I mean, what were the most critical things you found that you had to, uh, what you had to do to make it a success? There must have been a couple sort of moments, you know, one hurdle that was particularly important because you've been doing this a long time and yet you still came, I'm assuming, maybe I'm wrong, came up with issues or hurdles. What were the most critical things that you had to solve to make that successfully work through its lifetime? Uh, I actually have one <clears throat> um, and it's now baked into, I think our entire philosophy, which was this idea, it's like a rhizomic way of recording data. So small teams are working and you're generating, if you're doing this right, we're generating a, a huge amount of data, archival quality photographs, photographs that should be weighing in at 20 to 50 megabytes of each in real time. Now in an excavation, it's a bit more controlled. So there are the other things that you can you could do. You could build a, a local area network, but to keep it nice and zen here, that ability of, I, I have, this is what I did. I took these three pictures. I, had, I talked to the osteologist. I made those notes. That's actually relatively speaking to all the data of 188 people, not a whole lot of data. So we call that gem, just enough metadata just and just my data. And get that data to move to the next person and move to the next person, and move to the next person up the chain and checked along the way as it moves from device to device. That was, I think, the, the greatest innovation that we did. The challenge, though, was how do you back up 180 iPads a day? And that was just a total nightmare. I mean, we were, I mean, that was just an incredibly hard challenge. It was terabytes of data. Um, and the Frankly, the devices and the infrastructure aren't ready to accommodate that. The cloud challenge we have is, you know, it isn't so much when you're online or offline, it's that midline. It's like if you're going in and out of a slot canyon, I can imagine, you know, you could do that kind of work. And it's like, well, all right, do I have connectivity or not? So these are huge challenges, frankly. And it all comes down, I got real old school. I mean, step four, one is paper. Step two is I recorded my data and I have three copies of the data. So we don't have an incident like that and lose data. So that's a really these are these are incredibly hard challenges, I think. Um, and I don't think I don't think there's great answers yet, unfortunately. Okay, so who has a question? Who? Chat. You see it? It's on the, if you click the chat button. I just, I just see a really big head ahead behind me. Um I don't know. I mean, the, the the opinion on on what should and should not be saved was the sidebar conversation I had last night with Abby Smith Rumsey, and and again she caused my nerves on it. It's like we don't have to save everything. The quote that came from the person, his name is David, didn't get his last name. He said something really profound and got actually got a round of applause from it at the talk last night at the at the uh, Long Nile Foundation, and that was 
we are generating more data than we ever have effectively, but we're not archiving. Because archiving is a process to what Sarah said. It is a, it's a curated process for doing that. How much of the stuff that we're generating right now that's hitting social media do we even need to keep or want to keep? Like, like none of it, right, pretty much. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's a sampling strategy to do that. But I would say that the greatest challenges are figuring out how to make data that should not be preserved and should be should have a right to die, able to be able for that to be true. It's baked into the model of the of the data curation center in the UK. It's a model I personally, you know, accept. If you don't want your data archived, you should have the have the right for it to, you know, an advanced directive effectively. And for exactly when we're working with ethnography, with field work, with people. I have certainly had the opportunity to to bear witness to um, storytelling, uh, especially working with tribes that we recorded for the tribe, but it's not going anywhere. It cannot go into an archive publicly because that's not what they want. So, the, yeah, those are the challenges I think. Thoughts on that? We can see her again, but we're about out of time. So, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, fascinating book. Thank you so much. So, to see the history, you know, um, I remember all the developments uh, back when I first came here. Yeah. So, my question is um, kind of related to the question from Chris and several others that um, I can see that digital archaeology can be used for many different purposes, but is your goal? all about this archaeology and how is it tied to um, us being, we being in China as opposed to the tools being in charge. And I've been thinking about that for the past couple of days in particular because um, Kaz and I were using chat to um, to read some of the Japanese uh, authors and materials. And what we found was that if it's written clearly, it's a great tool. Um, but if we translate Japanese language into English, and if it's written in a Japanese style, then it's, the translation is no good. So it forces us to think in uh, in English way, even if people are um, using the Japanese language. It's kind of like translation, like uh, Star Wars, mm -hmm. uh, Star Trek, so, you know, people are communicating with each other. It looks like it's all convenient, but what we are learning is actually no, it's uh, actually we are really all lose diversity if we go to that direction. And this archaeology, archiving everything, even though we can archive a lot, it still forces us to do the archiving in a particular manner. So um, with that in mind, um, is the ultimate goal to record more, which I don't think is the case, and uh, um, that's not the case, what is your goal? Well, I mean, thank you. I mean, to make it yeah, on the personal level, and they, I'm telling you, I, I, the reason I don't want to open up the box about AI is because it's it's a big box. <laughs> uh, but when there is some, I mean, on, on the, the counterpoint of that, the problem right now with that, just to touch on that for a second, is what are the what are the languages being used to train the model? How big are the data sets being used? We know that. That's the, we can all figure that out. But my wife, Shinsia, has a team of over 40 archaeologists right now working in Saudi, in Saudi Arabia, and they're Italian. Um, and they're able to use ChatGBT in a very specific way to analyze documents that are not being fed to the to the to the model that are PDFs that are being controlled, and they're getting really good results that way. But they still have to proofread everything, as you said. So that's one. Job. So personally, um, we kind of put it into our tagline for Codify, and it's about collecting the right data for, for blasting. You know. Um, the with this project we just did in in Saudi, um, it turned out that there were rock art inscriptions that were pre-Islamic, Talmudic, and all this. So the photographs that were being taken were the right photographs for the purpose of the project, but they were the wrong photographs for actually doing the ass assessment analysis at a place where progress is going to erase that archaeology because they're building the line. In case you guys haven't heard about Neom, so in that case. I would suggest that I would like to see a way for technology to support people doing the very best work in the great in the most challenging conditions. It's kind of the tattoo I have on my arm at it's at it. And I still haven't lost that, so I'm still here doing it. 
Yeah. The line is terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. Wait till the end. <laughs> so we can cut it because <laughs> we will. Yeah. 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 So this reminds me a little bit of the transition that photographers went to. There was a certain point where professional photographers began to adopt digital, but they, they held out, right? They used they shot color slides for a long time. Um, but today photography and digital cameras really help in many ways. They, they can, um, and, and so in that respect, digital technology could, if you know, with all the, the added uh, struggles we have using this stuff in the field and battery life and everything, it could potentially assist in, in not you know limiting our uh, documentation, but rather guiding it. Like I have a friend who works in the robotic, he is a, he's a vendor for robotic surgeons. Uh, and they don't actually do the surgery, but they'll say like 90% of surgeons use this scalpel for this process. So it's sort of, it's adding that in and, and potentially with, you know, vision or you know, camera improvements, the, these technologies will be helping archaeologists but not you know, interfering and in, in flattening the uh, documentation. 100% agree. And, and so that's, that's where I started from, right? And it's like, I, I, when I look back and realize that uh, just on a personal front, I've been doing this, I didn't intend on becoming an archaeologist. I was, my dad was a photographer. He would have had his 100th birthday on the 29th of September. Mm -hmm. So I, I started with that. That's where I started with. Mm -hmm. And then in 20, 2000, we had a brownout in, at Chautau Hick and it killed my computer and the backup and the second backup. Mm -hmm. And we had to use date drive savers to re recover that data. So that began a journey, but this is, we have to be patient. There's a patience to it. There's the next, this is the gold rush now of AI, but I don't know. I mean, I'd love to hear from Bill on this too, but just having something that is reliable, that will work, that will allow us to record data, that we can train into, into the next generation of students, people in the back, <clears throat> um, that's all. <laughs> and that, that still seems ephemeral. Still, still seems like the chimera we just haven't caught yet. But I see a lot of nods. Yeah. Any other questions? Thanks for staying over. Thank you. Thank you.